Who are some of the dumbest criminals with the lowest IQ we covered in 2023? Let's get right to it with this marathon video. What are some of the dumbest schemes scammers are getting caught with today? Let's get started with... Number six, double checking. Vermita Miller scammed thousands of dollars from a wedding site called The Knot by concocting a wedding fraud scheme. If she hadn't tried to pull off the same scam twice, she might have gotten away with it. Miller booked her wedding reception in October 2016 through The Knot, a popular wedding website, and purchased a $10,000 event cancellation insurance policy. She claimed to have tripped on her wedding dress and suffered serious injuries, which meant she had no choice but to cancel the reception. Insurance provider Tokyo Marine collaborated with The Knot in 2016 to offer their event cancellation insurance product to couples who use the website booking service to help book their wedding venue. Following her fake injury and cancellation <laughs> of her reception, Miller submitted a claim with Tokyo Marine and provided falsified medical reports documenting her injuries. Tokyo Marine sent the $10,000 check to Miller and she would have gotten away with it, but she got greedy. Miller, somehow thinking this would work, then reported to the insurer that the check had been stolen. What she was planning on doing with the canceled check is anyone's guess. She even provided a fake police report to substantiate the claim. Tokyo Marine referred her claim to the Department of Insurance for investigation. During that investigation and discovery of her fraud, they learned that it wasn't the first time Miller had falsely reported a check as stolen. The case was prosecuted at the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office, where Miller pleaded no contest to one count of felony insurance fraud. Miller was sentenced to five years in county jail and ordered to pay $22,500 in restitution. She was remanded to the custody of the Century Regional Detention Facility in Linwood, where she's currently serving her sentence. Miller took to Facebook to say she would be better when she came out of jail and planned on picking up where she left off in her career. Maybe she also can come out with a better understanding of how checks work. Number five, PTA scamming. Mark Haynes was a former PTA co-treasurer for his daughter's school, and he was guilty of stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars. He might have been able to use his role in the PTA to access its money, but he operated without any real plan to stop himself from getting caught. Haynes served on the Eastside Elementary School Parent Teacher Association in New York City. He made unauthorized credit card payments from a PTA account, including 17 illegal payments to his personal credit card during his one-year tenure as a money manager manager in 2020, 2021. The payments totaled $185,717, which went towards personal expenses, such as luxury hotels in St. Lucia and Bermuda, and purchases at Fendi, Restoration Hardware, and Pottery Barn. It wasn't the first time Haynes had stolen from an organization. In 2016, he was arrested for stealing from a publishing company while he worked there. He even used some of the PTA's money to pay back roughly $24,000 of the $51,247 he owed his former employer. For some reason, Haynes was sure no one would notice that he was just freely spending money, but inevitably, they did. A suspicious payment of $9,081 caught the attention of the new co-treasurer of the PTA, who questioned Haynes about it in October 2021. Haynes asserted the transaction was a reimbursement to another PTA member's card for an urgent furniture purchase, as if there's any other kind, but he failed to produce any documentation to support his claim, increasing the suspicion. Suspicion. What could possibly constitute an urgent furniture purchase anyway? Let us know in the comments. Soon after, Haynes resigned from his position with the PTA, who reported him to the police. Haynes pled guilty to one count of grand larceny in the second degree at the Manhattan Supreme Court. As part of his plea deal, he agreed to pay back the full $185,717 within 90 days and had to avoid being rearrested during that time. Haynes was advised that as long as he met the conditions of his plea deal, he would be allowed to plead guilty to a lesser charge of grand larceny in the third degree. The lesser charge would only carry a sentence of two to four years in prison. Number four, just a simple Photoshop. 
Fraudsters used Photoshop to claim benefits in the UK from the Department for Work and Pensions, or DWP, despite living abroad. However, it was so clear the pictures were photoshopped that they were bound to get caught. The DWP asked one man for photographic proof of his residence by having him take a selfie by his front door. Since he wasn't living in the UK at the time, he photoshopped himself into an image instead. The photo was poor quality and it was obvious he'd edited it. There was a digital cutout around the man's outfit line and the reflection of a Google Street View camera could be seen in the car outside, indicating that the doctored image was likely part of a larger and more sophisticated scheme run by people who also don't know how to use Photoshop. The DWP's counter-fraud regional office in Newcastle, England, reported that fraudulent claims reached $10 billion in 2022. During the pandemic, there was a surge in universal credit claims, leading to increased fraudulent claims, causing some gangs to take advantage of the relaxed application rules. To combat this situation, the DWP set up an enhanced review team of 1,000 employees in seven regional offices to investigate suspicious activity. This team successfully managed to block tens of thousands of claims. Additionally, around 172,000 applications that appeared fraudulent were automatically suspended. In one case, analysts detected that multiple claimants attempting to prove they lived in the UK were using the same lime green door in photos. A gang of six other individuals ran a scam using claims in the names of 188 made-up children. The gang leader, Ali Bana Muhammad, enlisted his relative and others to help him submit bogus child benefit claims in roughly 70 names. The tax office raised suspicions when they noticed the same two phone numbers were calling the tax credit claims call center in connection with unrelated claims, which sounds like they got lucky. Muhammad was arrested and jailed for three and a half years. The DWP spokesperson mentioned that they have already reviewed 900,000 claims and made savings of $2.4 million from correcting and preventing fraud and errors last year alone. Number three, overcharged and overscammed. Lori E. Devaney, a former lawyer from Portland, Oregon, ran a continual Ponzi scheme where she defrauded injured clients of more than $3.8 million. Devaney stole identities, forged insurance checks, and deposited the funds into her own bank account. Devaney primarily targeted injured clients who trusted her to handle insurance insurance claims and compensation. Many of Devaney's victims had sustained severe brain and bodily injuries, leaving them in a vulnerable state where they needed financial assistance. They trusted her to represent their best interests, not realizing she was practically a vampire. Devaney would regularly lie to her victims, telling them that the compensation for their injuries would eventually show up in their accounts, even though she had already stolen it. Devaney stole from at least 135 clients between 2011 and 2019. Over the course of those eight years, she'd stolen almost $4 million. And that money went toward funding her extravagant lifestyle. Devaney loved going on elaborate trips, spending $173,000 on an African safari and big game hunting trips, and $150,000 on foreign and domestic flights. Devaney also spent $220,000 on cigars alone, $195,000 on her mortgage, $91,000 on a Cadillac and other recreational vehicle expenses, $58,000 on pet boarding and veterinary costs, and $35,000 on taxidermy expenses. With that much spent on taxidermy, it sounds like she needs to find a better vet. Without any plan to ever pay back her clients, it was only a matter of time before Devaney's scheme would be exposed. She appeared before a federal court where she pleaded guilty to one count each of mail, wire, bank fraud, money laundering, filing a false tax return, and two counts of aggravated identity theft. She received a 101-month federal prison sentence. Additionally, Devaney was ordered to pay over four and a half million dollars in restitution to her victims, including the Oregon State Bar Client Security Fund, known as the CSF, Wells Fargo Bank, and the IRS, all of whom suffered losses due to her scheme. The CSF made partial restitution payments to some of Devaney's victims, resulting in a loss of more than $1.2 million. Wells Fargo lost over $52,000 after Devaney stole and forged a check, and the IRS sustained a tax loss of more than $621,000 when she failed to report the stolen money on her income tax returns. Most of her victims never saw the compensation she promised them while they were her clients. Great job, Lori. Now people won't trust lawyers because of you. Number two, double dipping on the clock. Medgar Webster was a high-ranking police union official, but while he was supposed to be on duty as a police officer, he was working at a Whole Foods grocery store in Washington, D.C. Webster was 
once a vice chair of the Metropolitan Police Union in Washington, D.C., but had a job at two Whole Food locations between January 2021 and April 2022. Officers working in the nation's capitals are allowed to have second jobs. However, the department must authorize those jobs and cannot overlap or conflict with current duties. Webster didn't inform his police department that he was also working at the grocery store and would be on the clock at both positions, making double the money he usually would. It was an easy gig as long as he didn't do anything stupid. While Webster was working both positions, he received over $33,000 in pay from the Metropolitan Police Department, which included overtime and holiday pay. At the same time, he earned roughly $46,000 from Whole Foods. Webster might have gotten away with working both jobs if he didn't commit a crime at Whole Foods. Someone at the store accused him of harassing her at the supermarket, which led to an official investigation. Authorities investigated the allegations against Webster, where they uncovered his employment situation. Officers arrested and charged him with felony fraud in February 2023. Amid the investigation, Webster resigned from his union position and was stripped of his police powers. He faces up to 10 years in prison if he's found guilt. And worst of all, no more employee discounts at Whole Foods. Before we get to number one, if you enjoyed these stories about dumb scammers, definitely stay on this video to watch our previous release for more stories about the dumbest scammers. Number one, the cards for everyone. Nicole Cardona, a Miami-Dade resident, sold fraudulently obtained disabled parking placards. But Cardona didn't conceal her scheme well enough and made some big mistakes that put her on the authorities' radar. Cardona sold permits with forged doctor signatures, enabling her customers to obtain parking placards from the Florida Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles. She charged up to $200 per placard and would instruct her customers to send over their information and driver's licenses. Cardona would order them to meet her in a parking lot where she would provide them with pre-filled forms that contain forged doctor signatures. From there, Cardona told them to go to any DMV location and present the placard. In November 2021, a Miami Beach police detective noticed a driver exiting a vehicle parked in a spot reserved for people with disability placards. The driver was displaying a permit and told the detective it belonged to his grandmother, hoping the detective would fall for it. He did not. The detective found the circumstances suspicious, so he continued questioning the man. Eventually, the driver driver admitted he paid someone to get the permit from a doctor, and the placard was issued in his name. The man eventually told authorities he paid Cardona 150 bucks for the placard. Then he explained the entire scheme and still had Cardona's number in his phone. If you have some kind of criminal crew, you probably don't want this guy on the team. The police used her number to arrange two controlled buys with undercover officers. She gave them the exact instructions she'd given all of her customers, telling them to send her $200 via Cash App and giving them the pre-filled forms. Authorities arrested Cardona during one of the undercover sting operations conducted by Miami Beach Police. They charged her with felony offenses including organized scheme to defraud, criminal use of a public record or public records information, and forgery. She also faced a misdemeanor charge of making false documents. Here are a few of the worst girls on Instagram. Number 9. Jeannie Exum Jeannie Exum whose name sounds like a fantasy novel, was an Instagram and OnlyFans model. She was also a crazy person who went after her boyfriend with a particularly sharp kitchen utensil. When the NYPD showed up at her apartment, he told them they got into an argument and she attacked him in the arm and back with a kitchen knife. Luckily for him, he was taken to the hospital and survived. He was also a social media influencer who went by Baby Boy Pedrulis. Police arrested Exum and charged her with the crime. However, she got right out after being released without bail. She agreed to a no-contact order, which prevented her from speaking to her boyfriend or coming near him. For her 36,000 followers, she posted a picture with the police caption, quote, They took my phone, y'all. I'm on the trap right now. Whatever that means. Hurting her boyfriend was a good career move since her follower base doubled after the incident. Number 8. Bianca Chia Bianca Chia, a model and Instagram influencer, was arrested by Australian border police. They charged her with two counts of fraud for tricking investors out of a million dollars. Clearly, she was branching out from just taking pictures with products on social media. Her Instagram is no longer up, but this 40-year-old wellness guru had 1.3 million followers at her peak. She's being accused of misleading investors in her online business, Sportlux. Apparently, these investors didn't care about the company's dumb name, but they did care when they noticed her financial situation was more than suspicious. She could go to jail for up to two years, which wouldn't be great for her Instagram career. 
Investors say Chia lied about how much money she made from modeling and product placement on Instagram. A court found that she and her husband broke Australian consumer law and ordered them to repay the investors' funds. However, instead of paying them back, they declared bankruptcy. Before getting arrested, Chia told her Instagram followers that she would be taking a step back from social media to focus on her family. She said she hadn't been posting as much because she wanted to spend more time with her son. Surely it had nothing at all to do with her massive legal issues. Fraud, court battles, and bankruptcy didn't go with her wellness persona. Number seven, Gabby Castillo. Gabby Castillo's Instagram page didn't reflect reality. It was mostly just pictures of her wearing bikinis and taking selfies at the gym. More or less your run-of-the-mill Instagram hottie. However, she got arrested for being a suspected member of Union Tepito, a Mexican street gang. At the time of her arrest, she had 763,000 Instagram followers. Now, her Instagram doesn't exist. This was not a good time for her to get arrested as she was launching her singing career under the name Brela Sands. When the police caught up with her in Mexico, she had 1 million pesos in her car. The cherry on top? She's been romantically linked to the leader of Union Tepito, who's currently serving a 20-year sentence for multiple violent offenses. Number 6. Julia Rose in 2021, Julia Rose and five of her pals were arrested after they changed the Hollywood sign to say Holly Boob. Holly Boob might be funnier than Hollywood, but LAPD still didn't approve. They used a tarp to put a B over the W and a line through the D. This wasn't Rose's first publicity stunt, and it probably won't be her last. At the 2019 World Series, she flashed a picture. Rose claims the entire stunt was to raise awareness for breast cancer, a notable cause, but one you can take with a grain of salt since Rose also runs an adult magazine. Maybe it would be more plausible if she ran a breast cancer charity. The sign wasn't altered permanently, so she only got arrested for misdemeanor trespassing, and police released her rather quickly. The Hollywood sign is a frequent target for vandalism because of how famous and accessible it is. Anyone can walk up the hill. There are cameras, but there aren't usually police actively patrolling the area. Number 5. Yoon Lucy Lu Lee Last year, Hungarian police released images of Instagram influencer Yun Lu Li and her boyfriend being arrested. They managed to stay on the run and dodged the authorities for three months before police caught them in Budapest. Police wanted them for the death of their business associate, Tyler Pratt. The incident, an extended hide-and-seek game with the cops, earned them a new nickname. They were the millennial Bonnie and Clyde to the media. As if this wasn't bad enough, they tried to hurt Pratt's girlfriend and unborn child. She made no effort to change her appearance while they ran. This means she was either delusional about her chances of getting away, or just so vain that she couldn't bring herself to get a haircut or anything like that. The lovers hid out in Czech Republic and Slovakia before eventually going to Hungary. It's thought that Lee and her boyfriend both knew Pratt, and they took his life during what was supposed to be a business meeting. Lee is the daughter of a very wealthy and politically influential Canadian businesswoman. Lee has two twin sisters. They may share an appearance, but they don't share Lee's lust for crime. The three of them built a social media following together, posting pictures of themselves wearing matching bikinis. Lee's family issued a statement saying they were shocked and disturbed by the incident. They never saw it coming. Pratt probably didn't either. This was Lee's first time hurting someone, but it was not her boyfriend's. 2014, he was found guilty of a fatal drunk driving accident for which he got five years in prison. To this day, nobody knows why they did it or what went wrong during that meeting. Number four, Danielle Miller. Danielle Miller, an Instagram influencer from Miami, had 34,000 followers. Now, she's been charged with wire fraud. Most of her posts are being used against her in court. According to U.S. Attorney's Office, an investigation into Danielle by Homeland Security showed that she had stolen someone's identity by getting into their Registry of Motor Vehicles account. She then used all the information she stole from them to open a bank account and apply for a pandemic-related economic injury disaster loan. Her Instagram influencer career had not been affected by the pandemic at all. More than $100,000 was deposited into the bank account she had set up. Then, she took a private flight from Florida to California using the stolen identity. After getting this huge loan, she started posting all kinds of photos of herself in different luxury hotels in California. These are the posts that ended up getting used in court. They prove the money she received from her stolen identity scam paid for her luxury rooms. It's pretty hard to deny such concrete evidence. She basically snitched on herself. 
Her fraud may not have stopped at just one victim. The IP address used to apply for the loan was also used to access the online RMV accounts for a few other people. She used their identities to apply for nearly a million dollars worth of loans. She could face up to 20 years in prison and a quarter million dollar fine if she's convicted, but at least she got some good picks out of the deal. Number three, Kelly K. Green. At the 2020 Super Bowl, Kelly K. Green tried to get on the field and security arrested her for trespassing. Fans are not allowed on the field, no matter how many Instagram followers they have. Kay, who had 348,000 followers, saw the opportunity for a publicity stunt. Kay jumped over the rail, walked onto the field. She didn't make it very far before security took her into custody. Videos of the incident were all over social media, which may have been her plan all along. Police arrested her near one of the end zones and led her off the field. As they led her away in handcuffs, she managed to pull her dress up and show everyone her butt. Kay spent the night in jail and was released in a $1,000 bond. Perhaps she just wanted to know what it felt like to play football. Security tackled her like a linebacker in the Kansas City Chiefs end zone. So it sounds like she got her way. Number two, Kayla Massa. Kayla Massa was an Instagram and YouTube influencer known online as Kay Goldie. Her Instagram account, which has since been deleted, had roughly 330,000 followers when it was active. She also had around 107 subscribers on YouTube where she posted vlogs, hair tutorials, and that sort of thing. She seemed pretty inconspicuous. But then she tried to steal one and a half million dollars from her followers. She used Instagram to promote her scheme. She shared pictures of money, screenshots of bank balances and other things. Then she would make a post saying something like, if you got a bank account and you're interested in making legal money, hit me up ASAP. She would tell them that they could earn $5,000 by letting her friend use their bank account for a short period. Then she asked for an emptied out bank card and their pin, which she used to deposit the stolen money. Then she'd place $1,000 money orders and would draw the cash when it came through. Once the bank realized it was fraudulent, they recalled the money, leaving the victim with a negative balance of $1,000. Massa got hers, the bank got theirs, and the victims, who were mostly under 18 years old, were left holding the bag. Number one, Marcella Zoea. In 2019, Instagram model Marcella Zoea threw an IKEA chair off a condo tower near the Gardner Expressway in Toronto. Why would someone do this? For the internet cloud, of course. Someone recorded this chair throwing on their phone and posted it on Snapchat. She said she wasn't the one who actually posted it in court. We don't really believe her, but that's beside the point. In court, the judge roasted her pretty hard. She said Marcella had committed a hazardous act for her own pleasure and vanity, which is pretty much a perfect description of what she did. The judge also said the chair throwing was part of a disturbing trend, the trend of people acting like idiots to get attention on Instagram. Marcella had to pay a $2,000 fine, do 150 hours of community service, and stay on probation for two years. The judge wanted to send a message. That message is that posting videos of yourself breaking the law is a great way to get caught. And if you get caught, you can face serious legal consequences. It could have been much worse. Marcella could have gotten six months of jail time, but the judge decided that since Marcella was young and could probably act smarter in the future, she didn't need to go to jail. However, she'll live in infamy as chair girl outside her fan base. She's just lucky her chair didn't hurt anybody on the way down. What are some of the dumbest crimes people will actually do? Well, let's get right to it and find out. Starting with... Number seven, let's blow it as fast as possible. When South African Sibinjile Manny somehow got 850,000 pounds in her bank account, she thought it was a gift from God. The money actually came in through government aid that Manny depended on to help her through school. Normally, the grant would get her about 85 pounds per month, but this time she got over 10,000 times that amount. And instead of reporting this obvious error, Manny saw it as a sign that she was destined for the big leagues. So she started spending the money right away. Before the windfall, she was a poor accounting student who was scraping by. But once she received that money, all of that changed. Manny bought designer clothes and trashed her former wardrobe. She threw countless parties for her friends, bought them the latest iPhones, got her hair done, and started going to the most expensive bars in the area. Her new lifestyle had her blowing over 600 pounds a day. But that lifestyle couldn't last forever. In a twist of fate, it wasn't the police or the aid scheme itself that caught her. 
Manny slipped up on her own by leaving a receipt at a supermarket that showed that she had over 800,000 pounds in her account. That's a lot of money in most places, but in South Africa, it's even more. So the owners of the supermarket noticed something was up, told the police, and Manny was soon arrested. Astonishingly, she neither had to go to jail nor pay the money back. Her lawyer argued that she wasn't a danger to the community and hadn't done anything illegal to get the money. She ended up receiving a five-year suspended sentence and was told to complete 14 weeks of community service. The really dumb thing about this story is the fact that there's no way to get away with this. Is it possible that Manny legit thought she'd never get caught? When it's that amount of money suddenly missing and unaccounted for, someone is going to eventually come looking for it. And she was an accounting student, so she should know this. Or at least know how to hide the money. Or like, run away and live off the grid until she could figure out what to do with it. Number six, hop in. We're going after the X. Former NFL player Earl Thomas had his identity stolen by his ex-wife's new boyfriend. Thomas, who divorced his wife Nina in 2020, was robbed of almost $2 million through different nefarious means. Kevin Thompson, the new boyfriend and thief, did everything from cashing Thomas's checks, transferring ownership of his cars, to stealing directly from his bank account. Kevin had stolen Thomas's identity by opening a fake bank account with an ID that had all of Thompson's information, but Kevin's face. But Kevin could couldn't keep at it for long. He was eventually arrested by the police when he drove Thomas's Rolls-Royce Cullinan SUV to the bank where he wanted to transfer ownership of the vehicle. After he was processed and released, Kevin tried to get the SUV back from the sheriff's department, but came to get it in another vehicle that had been reported stolen. Of course, this led to another arrest, because why not? Make no mistake about it, Kevin Thompson was clearly a guy running low on brain power. It's like his brain was being run in battery saver mode or something. You might wonder why Kevin Thompson seemed to be targeting Earl Thomas other than the fact that Thomas was a rich Super Bowl champion. Well, it appears that there is no love lost between Thomas and his ex-wife Nina. In 2020, they reportedly drew weapons on one another in a parking lot, and Thomas himself had been arrested for harassing Nina at her job. And Nina is no saint either. Before their divorce, she was arrested for breaking into a vacation home and pointing a firearm at Thomas because she found him with, you guessed right, another woman. Number five, of course I'm a billionaire. Russell Dwayne Lewis was a high school graduate from Texas who had big dreams, or rather he had big lies. And he used those lies to steal almost $4 million from two victims. Lewis said that he had actually grown up in London and had a PhD in theoretical mathematics and statistics. He also said that he had master's degrees in neurophysics, genetics, and quantum physics. He was a busy guy, and you'd think that would be the least of his lies. But Lewis also claimed to be a rabbi who somehow operated a secret family investment firm called Naveem Equity. Lastly, he told his victims that he was worth around 10 to 30 billion dollars. Lewis also claimed that he had worked for the CIA, the Secret Service, and the LAPD. He was also an astrologer and had used his skills to help pick the jury for the 1995 O.J. Simpson trial. So obviously he's a real stable, solid guy. Duh. As bizarre and as ridiculous as these stories were, the these lies helped him scam one poor guy of over $3 million and another poor widow of over $550,000. He had met the widow through his astrology reading services and convinced her to send him $550,000 for a fake investment. Once Lewis got the money, he spent it on personal expenses and office supplies that he needed to reel in other victims. Lewis also orchestrated a complicated scheme where he got into a $290 million negotiation negotiation to purchase the Lord and Taylor department store. He sent in a fake bid accompanied by a fake letter from a foreign bank claiming to have millions of euros to finance the bid. The due diligence for this fake sale cost Lord and Taylor thousands of dollars in fees before they eventually realized Lewis was a con man. Lewis was finally caught and sentenced to eight and a half years in prison. Have you ever met anyone that just constantly told a bunch of super weird lies? Tell us all about it in the comments below. Number four, no, no, I crashed your Ferrari. Millionaire Richard Hansen claims that his chauffeur, Alan Securella, is responsible for crashing his Ferrari after allowing a friend to drive it. Securella had been Hansen's chauffeur for 17 years until they fell out on account of the crash. Hansen said that Securella 
Securella let his friend, Raymond Zarb, drive it, and Zarb crashed it. Securella, on the other hand, said that he was the one driving while Zarb sat in the passenger seat. After the crash, Hansen fired Securella and then hauled him and Zarb to court. The claim against Zarb was settled in an early stage, but legal complications involving the inability of Securella to prove his case led to it being dismissed. The judge in charge of the case then awarded 67,484 pounds damages claim against Securella. The trial seemed like that should be the end of it, but Securella decided to resurrect the case, fight the judgment. He still claimed that the crash was merely an innocent accident, and the fact that Zarb's injuries from it were on his left side proves Zarb was in the passenger seat. But here's the issue. Fighting the case could cost Securella a total of 478,484 pounds in court costs, leaving him in financial jeopardy. As of the release of this video, Hansen has a 412,000 pound charging order held over Securella's 800,000 pound family home because of the previous costs ordered against him. If this judgment doesn't go his way, he may end up losing everything. What do you think? Should Hansen have let it go even if Securella had allowed his friend to drive the Ferrari? Or do you think it's fair to go after Securella this way? Let us know in the comments below. Number three. Yeah, about those three bankruptcies. 2020 was a rough year for everyone, including Dominic Chappelle. First, his wife kicked him out and began divorce proceedings. A few months later, a judge sentenced him to six years behind bars. Back in 2015, billionaire Philip Green, the owner of a British home store's department store, sold the business to Chappelle for the normal price of one pound. Green had engineered the sale because the business was hemorrhaging money and was in so much debt that the only option was to just find a buyer and get out. The goal of the sale was to allow Chappelle to turn the fortunes of the business around and possibly make it profitable again. But in Instead of trying to save the failing business, Chappelle decided to fund his extravagant lifestyle. The company's financial problems didn't stop him from living his best life. Instead, it sort of spurred him on. Chappelle started by drawing a salary of 510,000 pounds from the business. Next, he bought himself a 200,000 pound racing yacht, a 1 million pound speedboat, a Bentley, and Beretta firearms. He then took expensive trips to the Bahamas. Chappelle also hired a helicopter, but when he was asked why, he said it was to fly directly to stores around the country to see what was happening, like you do. After a few years of draining millions from the already debt-ridden company to finance his magnificent lifestyle, the house of cards came crashing down. The company became bankrupt and all the stores closed down, creating a devastating loss of 11,000 jobs across the UK and leaving a pensions black hole of more than 500 million pounds. But Chappelle cared little for such things. Chappelle had managed to evade paying over 600,000 pounds and taxes through his spending spree. Basically, he had run the company into the ground, spent lavishly on himself, and still avoided paying his taxes. In court, he claimed that he had been too busy to run the company properly, which was kind of true. Chappelle said his financial advisors were at fault for him evading his taxes and the company getting bankrupt. We kind of doubt that his advisors told him to purchase yachts, speedboats, and Bentleys, though. Unless they weren't actually advisors, but just people being like, yeah, dude, go charter a helicopter and fly around. To make things even worse, Chappelle's wife had sent him packing around the same period and he had to live in a hotel. And things weren't going to get any better for Chappelle either, because during his trial, it was discovered that he had also wrongfully diverted one and a half million pounds of funds from BHS to a company in Sweden. The government also didn't let him off for the whole the company's crash left in the pension scheme. Chappelle was forced to pay over nine million pounds back to the scheme, and Philip Green, who had sold him the business, was forced to pay back three 363 million pounds. The government picked up the rest of the tab. In the end, Chappelle was sentenced to six years in jail. The judge mentioned that Chappelle had previously bankrupted three businesses, so being reckless with finances was kind of a thing with him. This guy was always biting off more than he could chew and always let someone else take the fall. The thing is, Chappelle could have lived the same fast life without any consequences if he had just taken some time to run his businesses properly. Number two, a note is what I've got. Thomas Muse had the clever idea that he could rob a pharmacy by wearing a surgical mask, a hat, and armed with nothing but a note. And it worked! Just kidding, he was caught about as easily as you'd think. On the note, Muse said that he was an armed robber and had a weapon. The note also said that he would hurt the person standing closest to him if he wasn't immediately given what he wanted on his list. Muse had just walked in and gave the pharmacy tech dealing with him his note. But the tech didn't even read the note at first and just asked him routine questions. When she finally got around to reading 
receiving the note, she immediately took the note to the head pharmacist, who then packed the pills Muse demanded. The pharmacist also placed the note back in the bag he handed over to Muse. Muse left the pharmacy, thinking his job was done, but things soon got tricky for him. As he left the pharmacy, cops were on his tail. After a short pursuit, he was caught and handcuffed. The police found all the evidence, including the note on him, so it was an open and shut case. Muse was hit with a slew of charges, including robbery, trafficking, and possession. He definitely seems like one of those people with a pretty entitled attitude. Speaking of bratty people, be sure to stay tuned right here to find out how other entitled people found out about the consequences of their actions in our past release. Number 1. The Ironic Rapper Nico Pandetta made an Italian rap song where he bragged about evading arrest. Unfortunately, he couldn't live up to his song lyrics as he was arrested shortly after making the video and sentenced to jail for his dealings in illegal substances. Pandetta is known for bragging about crimes in his songs, but when asked about the lyrics, he usually said that he was inspired by his mafia boss uncle who is currently behind bars. When Pandetta made a song about a robbery financing his first CD, his concert was banned. This inadvertently made him even more popular. When he was sentenced, this sort of Drake lookalike told his fans that he would tough it out with his head held high. But as the day for his jail term came closer, Pandetta posted an apology where he said that he had changed and would pay for his crimes. But our guy had no plans of doing that. A few days before Pandetta was to report to jail, he skipped town. But his life on the run didn't last long and the police quickly grabbed him. All they had to do was run a check on his friends and quickly discovered that one of them had a bed and breakfast that that was booked. The police staked out the motel and soon saw Pandetta walking out of the place and boom, game over. Pandetta was sentenced to four years in prison. Who knows what lyrics he might be inspired to write now that he's behind bars. Writing bars behind bars. What are some of the most idiotic scams that people try to actually pull? Let's get right to it and start with number six, the wet Bugatti. This classic YouTube clip is something most people recognize, but do you remember the backstory? In 2009, motorist Andy House purposefully drove his Bugatti supercar into the Gulf Bay Lagoon to collect insurance money. House owned an exotic car salvage yard in Texas. He claimed the accident happened when he swerved uncontrollably after being distracted by a low-flying pelican. They're truly a menace. While he reached for his cell phone. Immediately after the incident, he placed an insurance claim. House was unaware that a bystander was filming him and caught the whole incident on camera. The car sucked in a bunch of salt water and ruined the engine. House also left the Bugatti's engine running causing further and irreparable damage to the vehicle. The bystander uploaded the video to YouTube, which went viral and received over 4 million views. The video caught the car plunging into the water and House climbing out of the vehicle. Oopsies. Unfortunately for House, the video had over 5 million views. His demeanor in the video was suspicious, as he seemed unfazed by what should have been a traumatic incident. He was weirdly calm as he climbed out of the car, although House might not have seemed so relaxed if he knew he was on camera. Driving such an expensive luxury vehicle was bound to catch people's attention. The flashy car was worth $1 million in October 2009, making House's actions and demeanor even more confusing. Before the incident, House took out a $2.2 million insurance policy on the vehicle. Right after ditching it in the lagoon, he filed a claim for the whole amount, making it one of the most expensive single car accidents in US history. His insurance company, Philadelphia Insurance Companies, was skeptical about House's story. They thoroughly investigated his claim, committing extensive resources over four years to fight it. They secured witness statements and received an anonymous call regarding House's scheme to destroy the car for the insurance proceeds. Philadelphia Insurance Companies filed a lawsuit in 2010 to rescind their insurance policy with House and to seek damages for breach of the insurance contract and fraud. The scheme caught the attention of the FBI, who filed a federal lawsuit against House. He pleaded guilty to wire fraud in August 2014 and was sentenced to a year and a day in federal prison. House also had to pay $600,000 in restitution and had to serve three years of supervised release after leaving prison. But somehow he got away with defaming pelicans. Peter, where are you? Get him! Number 5. Dr. Gamble 
Dr. Aled Marion Jones is a kidney specialist who worked at a hospital in Wales with a gambling problem that eventually spiraled out of control. He had racked up so much debt that he turned to his workplace to bail him out. Jones doubled down on his hours worked, came in on days off, and even drove for DoorDash to responsibly cover his debts. Just kidding. Jones stole nearly $83,000 instead. Jones went to the bereavement services department at his hospital, the University Hospital of Wales in Cardiff, over two years he took 420 checks from the department on top of writing forged checks and claiming that he worked shifts that he hadn't. Jones's gambling problem developed when he was studying at Oxford University. He began by placing bets on World Cup soccer matches. From there, his habit escalated into a full-blown addiction. Of course, Jones couldn't run from his problems forever, and accounting was eventually going to find out. His employer soon realized something suspicious was happening and opened an investigation into Jones's activities. The medical medical tribunal suspended his medical license for at least 12 months. He tried to reapply and return to work. The tribunal held a review hearing where they examined evidence about his recovery from gambling and concluded that he wasn't far enough along in his recovery journey to practice medicine again. They extended the suspension for a further four months. The severity of Dr. Jones's gambling problem was undeniable. In 2009, he lost $12,000 in just one night in a U.S. Open tennis match between Juan Martin del Potro and Roger Federer. Although he stole a significant amount of money from the hospital, it was still only a fraction of the money he owed. Jones was unable to make his mortgage payments, and the bank repossessed his apartment. Jones was arrested and charged with fraud for misusing his position and fraud on false representation. He pleaded guilty to both charges and was sentenced to two years in prison and a two-year suspension. The court also ordered him to perform 200 hours of unpaid work as punishment for the money he took. But do we we still have to call him doctor. Number four, rental posing. Husband and wife, Jonathan Lucas and Melissa Ellis, posed as landlord and tenant for nine years, during which time they claimed hundreds of thousands of dollars of British taxpayers' money. They ran their scam from 2008 to 2017, in which time the couple stole $132,000, lived in a luxurious home, and took their three children on expensive holidays to the US, Dubai, and Portugal. They also spent money on flashy cars, such as Mercedes, Jaguar, and Range Rover. Melissa posed as the tenant and claimed rental assistance from the government, which she paid to Jonathan, who posed as the landlord. Jonathan, a self-employed businessman, posed as her landlord and the property owner. Although they told the British government they weren't living as a couple, they lived at the same address the entire time. The couple claimed benefits from the Department of Work and Pensions. Jonathan gave an address for a separate property nearby to avoid raising suspicions. He's sneaky like that. However, paying guests often rented his supposed main address as a vacation home. They could have maintained a low profile if they hadn't stolen so much money or run their scam for so long. Rather than quitting while they were ahead, they kept going even though it was obvious the government would eventually catch them. Fraud investigators discovered the couple's scam in the summer of 2017 and conducted surveillance on the couple's property. Investigators found the supposed tenant and landlord were living in a luxurious four-bedroom home protected by security gates with a convoy of vehicles in the driveway. The pair was arrested on the spot. In court, Melissa pleaded guilty to two counts of making a dishonest representation to obtain benefit and three counts of dishonestly failing to notify a change of circumstances. She was sentenced to two years and three months in jail. Jonathan pleaded guilty to two counts of encouraging or assisting the commission of an offense. His prison sentence was one year and nine months, slightly less than his wife's. The change in scenery shouldn't be too dramatic at least. They'll still be in a home protected by security gates and there'll be a convoy of vehicles in the driveway. Former state employee Robin Falsam faked multiple pregnancies to obtain 265 hours of paid leave. Falsam was working as the Director of External Affairs for the Georgia Vocational Rehabilitation Agency, known as the GVRA, making an annual salary of roughly $100,000. She announced the birth of her first child in July 2020, and by October 2020, claimed to be pregnant again. During that time, Falsam took 265 hours of paid leave granted to her by the family.
Family Medical Leave Act, for which she otherwise wouldn't have been eligible. Her scheme unraveled when a co-worker noticed she was wearing a fake pregnancy costume under her clothes and got so mad about it. The co-worker then told on Folsom to the head of the state agency, who opened an investigation into Folsom's actions. Folsom had created a fictitious identity for the fake father of her alleged children and shared that false information with the GVRA before beginning her requested time off. The inspector general's office learned there were no birth certificates proving Folsom was a mother, and medical and insurance records showed no indication of her ever even giving birth. Co-workers were suspicious of Folsom, who was showing and even sending them pictures of her alleged children. The children in the images had varying skin colors and didn't look anything like Folsom, which is really weird on its own the more you think about it. She actually had to find and choose these pictures of other people's children, but just pick random kids that didn't even resemble her. Uncomfortable co-workers were like, yeah, he looks just like you. So cute. But recognizing the stock photo from a frame they saw at Walmart. Although Folsom made thousands of dollars in paid time off, it was only a matter of time before the truth was revealed, especially when it was so easy to prove that she had been lying. Folsom resigned from her position in October 2021 after an interview with state investigators and faced criminal charges for her actions. She pleaded guilty to identity fraud and making false statements and the court ordered her to pay over $12,000 in restitution to the state and five years of probation. Her punishment is still cheaper than actually having kids. Number two, Weekend at Ralph's. 55-year-old Pennsylvanian Timothy Gritman impersonated his deceased father to get access to hundreds of thousands of dollars from his pension. Gritman's father, Ralph Gritman, retired from the Nassau County Clerk's Office in 1992 and moved to a retirement community with his wife in Pennsylvania around three years later. When Ralph's wife passed away in 2010, Ralph moved in with Tim in 2014. The father and son moved to Wyoming together in August 2017. Relatives noticed Ralph was looking unwell and worried about his health. He entered a hospital emergency room in September 2017, which was the last time he used his Medicare benefits. In 2019, Tim told a family member his father had passed away several years earlier, but refused to disclose the location of the burial. With Ralph out of the way, his son had full access to his father's benefits. Tim stole a total of $240,985 from Ralph's NY State Pension and Social Security funds. The New York State's Comptroller's Office opened an investigation into Tim's activities after receiving a call to their fraud hotline. The comptroller's office coordinated with the FBI and Pennsylvania authorities, where they discovered Gritman had been stealing funds since October 2017. But Tim claimed his father was still alive and kept requesting the pension payments, even after they were suspended. In response, the comptroller's office asked for photographic evidence of Ralph Gritman holding a current ID card to prove he was still alive. Tim attempted to disguise himself as his father by using makeup to whiten his hair and eyebrows and took a picture of himself holding a fake Pennsylvania state identification card. But other evidence mounted against him. It was becoming clear that Ralph was no longer alive, having used his Medicare benefits in 2017 and never using them again. The photograph Tim thought he was so clever with ended up serving as further proof that he was committing fraud. Tim was charged with wire fraud and social security fraud and pleaded guilty to both charges in U.S. District Court in Philadelphia. The maximum sentence for wire fraud is 20 years in prison and a 250 thousand dollar fine and the maximum sentence for social security fraud is five years in prison and a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar fine tim's sentence could be even higher though due to the amount of money he stole he faces up to 285 years in prison and a 3.7 million dollar fine his sentencing hearing is in may of 2023 despite the investigation and trial ralph gritman's body has never been found sadly this story could have been filled with tons of weekend at bernie style comical hygiene situations you let us down, Tim. Before we get to the last story, definitely stay on this video to watch our previous release for criminals who were too dumb to stay off of social media. Number one, expired employees. Don Victor Sisternino fraudulently obtained millions of dollars of Paycheck Protection Program or PPP loans when he lied about how many people he employed in his total monthly payroll. Sisternino claimed his consultancy firm Magnifico employed 441 people 
people and had an average monthly payroll of $2.9 million. However, at least three of the people he claimed worked for him were deceased, and the W-2 tax forms he submitted for his employees had incorrect, duplicate, or incomplete social security numbers. In fact, the only person working at Magnifico was Sister Nino. He received $7.2 million in loans, which he used to pay off a debt of $1.4 million to a relative. Once he got rid of his debt, Sister Nino bought a $3.5 million mansion, made a $48,000 payment on a Maserati, spent $200 $151,000 on a Mercedes and $89,000 on a Lincoln Navigator. He also paid $175,000 to GoDaddy.com to buy website domains and paid $403,000 to small film production companies. Of course, his mansion was his most significant purchase. It was a 12-acre, 12,579-foot property with its own movie theater, British-style pub, four-car garage, pool, tennis court, office, and a five-stall horse barn. Sister Nino made no effort to even hide his newfound wealth and should have probably spent more time covering up his scam rather than focusing on elaborate purchases. Sister Nino stated his employees were earning $85,000 a year, but they all had the same amount of taxes deducted from their wages, which isn't how withholdings typically work for people employed at the same company. Sister Nino's profit and loss statements were also confusing. He sent them to the bank with incorrect math and some form showing miscalculations for tax withholdings. With so much clear evidence against him, it was only a matter of time before authorities grew suspicious of Sister Nino. Sister Nino was indicted on two counts of wire fraud, three counts of aggravated identity theft, and three counts of illegal monetary transactions. He faced the possibility of a hefty sentence that included 20 years for wire fraud, 10 years for illegal monetary transactions, and a mandatory consecutive sentence of two years for aggravated identity theft. What are some of just the dumbest crimes? Well, let's find out, starting with... Number six, twice the miles, twice the smiles. Convicted felon Lawrence Harge entered into a contract with the DC government after he claimed he invented a way to double the range of electric vehicles. Harge created a cell phone sized box that he claimed would increase electric vehicle range by over 75%. DC's Department of Public Works was looking for new technology to extend its vehicle's lifespans and keep maintenance costs down, so this tech caught their attention. Although experts said that the self-proclaimed inventor's claims were impossible, the department signed a $680,000 contract with Harge's company, EV Technology LLC. The department referred to the project as the Black Box Technology Pilot Program, which called for the installation of 40 of the black boxes into the parking enforcement's fleet of Chevrolet Bolt electric vehicles. The contract worked out to $14,000 a vehicle, which was roughly half of the retail value of a Chevy Bolt. That's a lot of wasted money since the department's vehicles traveled less than 25 miles per day anyway. EV Technology LLC claimed in the contract that its battery attachment technology would regenerate itself and revolutionize electric vehicle batteries. Industry experts spoke out against the company's bold claims, especially when the largest automakers in the world were spending billions of dollars on research to try and engineer even single percentage increases in EV ranges. Nathan Baca from WUSA9 conducted an investigation with the help of Paul Albertus, Associate Director of the Maryland Energy Innovation Institute. Paul said that technologies that could boost an EV's battery pack to something significantly above the 200-mile standard range didn't exist yet. The amount of energy that a battery could store was just too limited for Harge's invention to work and that to re-energize a battery would involve breaking it open rather than wiring a box in the way that Harge's invention did. Baca reached out to General Motors, the makers of the Chevy Bolts, who wrote in a formal statement that they weren't involved in the project or unaware of the technology that Harge was using. Despite WUSA9's findings about Harge's bogus product, the inventor claimed in 2022 that the University of Michigan notified him that he was the 
perfect candidate for a Nobel Prize, and they plan to nominate him for the award. WUSA reached out to a university spokesperson who said that nobody at the University of Michigan was familiar with Harge. In 2001, Lawrence Harge got a 26-year prison sentence after he was found guilty of selling unregistered securities from Mississippi. The convicted felon served five years in prison and attempted to expunge his criminal record in 2021. Although he received a temporary felony expungent, a judge rescinded it after allegations that Harge repaid the people he defrauded in 2001 with business investors' money. The D.C. Office of Contracts and Procurement claimed to have no idea about Harge's criminal past until WUSA9 told them, which is like, why? That's a lot of money to just hand someone you know nothing about. Harge posted a video on Facebook where he bragged about working with the D.C. government on 40 cars, and the department wanted to add his device to thousands more vehicles. Six weeks after learning the truth about Harge, the D.C. government terminated their contract over violations of terms of the agreement and said they wouldn't pay any money. It was fairly easy for Baca and his team to debunk Harge's claims, which makes you wonder why it was so hard for the D.C. government. So who's the bigger moron? The guy making absurd claims that could easily be discovered, or the government who believed it without even fact-checking? We know the answer, but shout it out in the comments below. Number 5. Just for Lux Instagram influencer Ulya Pugachev tricked out her Dodge Charger to look like a police car. Pugachev, who has 1.8 million Instagram followers, turned her vehicle into a cop car complete with lights and sirens. She painted the Dodge Charger with the same color as the Florida Highway Patrol vehicle's colors and a decal resembling a police badge on the side of the vehicle. The Highway Patrol was conducting an unrelated traffic stop in Miami when it noticed what appeared to be an official law enforcement vehicle speeding past. While the vehicle had an identical paint job to a highway patrol cruiser and an emergency siren and light bar, officers quickly spotted that it was an imitation. So police pulled Pugachev over and she told them she was just test driving the vehicle. The influencer, who owned several car-related businesses with her husband, eventually admitted that she owned the car as part of her security service fleet. Pugachev was arrested and charged with imitating a Florida Highway Patrol vehicle's colors, misusing a dealer license plate, and failing to register a vehicle. She claimed to have fallen in love with the color scheme of Florida Highway Patrol vehicles and requested that a rap business help her recreate the black and tan aesthetic. And like, okay, there's loads of people who've bought retired police cars and dressed them up to look like they did when they're in service. Many security services even attempt to make their cars look like they're with law enforcement, so this isn't automatically a crazy town thing. But what do you make of some random Instagram lady insisting that she just loves the look? We're not into profiling anyone here, but she probably doesn't look like like most other people who own cop cars. What do you think? Was she up to no good? Or is she really a cop car nerd? Number four, everyone else is wrong. A Nebraska drunk driver called 911 to report that someone was driving on the wrong side of the road. The problem was that it was him. As the driver sped down the highway, he noticed that a vehicle was driving on the wrong side of the road. So he called the police to let them know that some idiot thinks they're James Bond. During the call, the driver then claimed another vehicle almost ran him off the road and had its brights on. Law enforcement arrived at the scene, and when they approached the driver, they could tell by his behavior that he was wasted. The police asked the man if he knew why they stopped him, and he said he realized that he had been driving on the wrong side of the road. He said that the reason for his reckless driving was that he had missed his exit. As a side note, reckless is kind of a weird term for driving dangerously, isn't it? it makes it sound like you're driving without wrecking. Yes, we know it's two different words, but anyway, the guy admitted that he was the one that made the original original 911 call and it turned out that his blood alcohol level was over two times the legal limit. He arrested the guy and thankfully no one was injured. It's a funny story but seriously someone could have lost their life. Head-on collisions are no joke. Just ask Ed Truck. But seriously please drink responsibly. Everyone's lives have been touched by the actions of a drunk driver at one point or another and it's totally avoidable. Number three, check the schedules. Trainee doctor Tracy Landu Landu claimed 9,865 pounds in sick pay from Britain's National Health Service while working at two different hospitals. Landu Landu's scam occurred over five months in 2020 while she worked as a GP specialty trainee at St. Helens and Nosley Teaching Hospitals. 
She had told her employer that she was ill and had to take a leave of absence. During the time when she was supposed to be fighting an undisclosed illness, she worked 8 to 13 hour shifts for United Lincolnshire Hospitals, located 160 miles from her original hospital. When officials confronted her about working while she was on sick leave, she denied their accusations. However, it was so easily provable that her partner even warned her that she'd lose her job if she didn't stop the scam. It was inevitable that Dr. Landu Landu would be discovered working during her sick leave, and hospital officials did eventually uncover her lies. The General Medical Council launched a formal investigation into Landu Landu's sick pay claims. The disgraced doctor said that she didn't think she was on official sick leave at the time, despite the hospital's HR staff asking for a doctor's note. She later confessed to lying to an HR official who recorded that Landu Landu denied working while claiming the money. During the hearing, the counsel for the General Medical Council said that Landu Landu's misconduct was a serious case of dishonesty and that she'd had the opportunity to stop what she was doing, but didn't. The Medical Practitioners Tribunal Service found her guilty of serious professional misconduct and suspended the trainee doctor for nine months. The tribunal believed that Landu Landu was struggling in her personal life, which could have influenced her conduct and contributed to her behavior. Landu Landu agreed to repay the money that she took and formally apologized for her actions. And like, why, Dr. Landu Landu, would you run a scam like this? It's weird. You're a doctor, so you put in a lot of work towards your very expensive education and you risked it all. You were set to make good money, but instead you scammed and worked while you were scamming. It's not even like you were making that much money to make the risk worth it. And you did it during the pandemic when you were needed the most. Paging Dr. Moron, Dr. Moron to the unemployment line. Number two, technology wins. When thieves stole Jay Robinson's two cars from his driveway, he used Google Earth to track them down. Robinson went to bed on a Thursday night with his Volkswagen Golf and seat Attica in his driveway and awoke the following day to find they were gone. Burglars had crept into his home during the night and snatched the keys while he was sleeping. The burglars later advertised the seat for sale on Snapchat. A friend told Robinson about the scam, so he decided to reach out to them personally. Robinson asked the burglars to return the vehicles, but they said they would only give it back if he paid them $2,500. The thieves sent him a blurry picture of the vehicle's front seat to prove they still had both cars. They thought the picture would convince Robinson to pay the ransom. Instead, it helped him locate the stolen vehicles. Robinson smartly used Google Earth to pinpoint the car's location, which was in a neighborhood six miles from his home. Given the way technology is these days, it was pretty clever of him to convince the thieves to send a picture. Robinson arrived at the location and found his car sitting there. He used his keys to unlock the vehicle, but instead of driving away, he reported it to the police. Although law enforcement quickly responded, they insisted on taking the vehicle in for forensic examination rather than immediately giving it back to Robinson. He was devastated and posted the details of the theft on social media as well as his disappointment in the way the police handled the case. Since they failed to find his other vehicle, the Volkswagen Golf, Robinson was left without a vehicle. He said that if he hadn't reported the burglary to the police, he could have driven away with his car that day. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to check out our past release to find out how this cop decided to do this dumb crime. Number one, check this out. Armed robber Andrew Hennels threatened grocery store employees after bragging on Facebook that he was going to rob the store because genius. Hennels went into Tesco, a grocery store chain in the UK, less than 15 minutes after he made the Facebook post. He brandished a knife and demanded that the cashiers empty their registers. Law enforcement received an emergency call from the supermarket chain and rushed to the scene while Hennels stole a car from a retired couple who had stopped to use the ATM near the store. Officers recovered a knife at the scene and quickly located their suspect at a nearby pub with roughly $500 of stolen money in his pocket. The police arrested Hannels and took him into custody where a judge requested up-to-date information on Hannels' mental state before proceeding to understand the reason behind his actions. Authorities found that earlier on the day of the robbery, Hannels shared a picture of the knife he used. During his trial, the prosecution discussed the trauma that the supermarket employees experienced and the number of officers who rushed to the scene after receiving the the emergency call. While the court struggled to decipher Hannels' motive, his Facebook activity helped to confirm that he was guilty of the armed robbery. The judge deemed Hannels to be a high risk to society and sentenced him to four years in prison. So Hannels, of sound body and mind, got himself four years in the clink for less than $1,000 because he bragged about his crime before he committed it? With that kind of brain power, we suspect he was going to end up there eventually. 
Do these criminals actually think? No, of course they don't. Let's start with number six, The High Life. A major crime ring operating in New York City made headlines when it was busted by federal authorities. The ring consisted of six individuals, Victor Augusto, Perfecto de Leon, Luis Lopez, Andres Reyes, Nestor Rivera, and Peter Vasquez. These individuals were accused of running a large-scale operation with connections to a Mexican cartel. The bust revealed an impressive amount of illegal activities. Over $2 million worth of cars and contraband were seized, including 12 kilograms of stuff valued at $900,000. The luxurious lifestyle of the dealers was on full display with a fleet of high-end vehicles, including a Lamborghini Huracan, Rolls-Royce Ghost, Bentley, Audi R8 Spider, Mercedes CLS 63, Mercedes S550, Range Rover Sport, and BMW M4. Not only did these guys indulge in lavish cars, but they also spent their money on extravagant gifts for their families. The items seized included a $3,000 Versace stroller, Rolex watches, Chanel handbags, Versace dresses, gold jewelry, and diamond encrusted rings. Their social media accounts were filled with posts flaunting their opulent lifestyle, which ultimately led to their downfall. And they didn't stop at material possessions. They also treated themselves to luxurious vacations. They rented waterfront properties in Miami and documented their lavish getaways on Instagram, further exposing their illegal activities to law enforcement. To protect their illicit business, one of the defendants relied on a, eh, let's call them not so nice street gang known as the Young Gunners or YGs based in Bushwick, Brooklyn. This gang provided protection for their trafficking operation. The individuals involved in this illegal substances criminal ring were also found to have connections to Mexican cartels, according to federal authorities. Despite their attempts to live a glamorous lifestyle, they failed to establish legitimate businesses to launder their ill-gotten gains. As a result of their actions, the defendants faced serious charges and potentially lengthy prison sentences. If convicted, they would face a minimum of 10 years to life behind bars for their involvement in trafficking and related crimes. And really, a Versace stroller? Number five, the interview. Eric Rivers, a bank robbery suspect in Gwinnett County, Georgia, found himself in a comically ironic situation during his alleged crime spree. After robbing a Chase Bank in Lawrenceville, Georgia, Rivers made the mistake of appearing in an on-camera interview with a local news station for an unrelated story about public transit. Look, the man has opinions, okay? Unbeknownst to the reporter, Rivers was casing another bank in the area when he agreed to the interview. As he removed his hat and do-rag, which he allegedly wore during the robberies, a bank manager observed him walking towards the news van after leaving the building. Lawrenceville police, who were investigating the reported robberies, followed up on the lead provided by the bank manager and obtained Rivers' name from the news station. The incident left law enforcement authorities astounded by Rivers' apparent lack of brains. Lawrenceville police detective Scott Pendergrass believed that Rivers was caught off guard and surprised by the reporter's interview. The department took the opportunity to offer advice to would-be criminals on their Facebook page, advising against agreeing to an interview with a news crew while casing a bank for an additional robbery. It was alleged that Rivers attempted a total of five bank robberies, but was only successful in two. Following his ill-fated interview, Rivers was arrested and was expected to face charges related to the bank robberies. It's worth noting that we couldn't find specific information on the outcome of Eric Rivers' case, such as arrest records or sentencing details. If you have any additional information, please let us know in the comments. And what were his thoughts on public transportation? His opinions mattered enough that he got arrested for them, so what did he say? Number four, the Dirty Dancer. Yanlin Rivera Bosa, an exotic dancer from Miami, found herself in big trouble after allegedly engaging in a cunning scheme to defraud a patron of the arts. According to police reports, Yanlin and several other women performed dances for the victim in a private VIP room at their club. The dancers took advantage of his intoxicated state by continuously pouring drinks down his throat until he was unable to stand. While her colleagues distracted the victim with their interpretive dance moves, we're sure they were very artistic, Yanlin seized 
the opportunity to swipe the man's cell phone and wallet. As the victim left the club, he realized some of his belongings were missing and decided to check his accounts. To his shock, he discovered unauthorized PayPal withdrawals totaling $62,345, along with unfamiliar charges on his Chase, Wells Fargo, and American Express cards. The evidence pointed to Yanelin, who actually stored her number in his phone to transfer payments to herself, probably to keep in contact with him. They had a real connection, you know. Upon contacting the police, she initially claimed that the victim had authorized the transactions. However, investigators grew skeptical when they found text messages on her phone that she sent to her husband and one of her friends complaining about how he canceled one of her PayPal transfers. The nerve of this guy, right? In addition to the fraud, police found evidence on Yanlin's phone indicating her involvement in the sale of illegal growth hormones and steroids. The evidence pointed to her role as a supplier, offering performance enhancing substances to clients directly from the interpretive dance club. As a result of the incriminating evidence and testimonies, Yanlin was arrested and is now facing multiple charges related to fraud and her dealing. What kind of world do we live in where you can no longer trust interpretive dancers when they're intentionally getting you plastered? Number three, the smart rapper. Aspiring rapper Ladarian Chandler was arrested for connection with a shooting of John McGee in Lakeland, Florida. The incident occurred following an argument between Chandler and McGee in the street. McGee, known as Bang Bang, probably because he was always knocking too hard on doors, so the name makes sense if you know him, and was a reputed gang member with a history of misconduct. Although he was released from prison just two months prior to the incident, his confrontation with Chandler turned fatal when he was attacked from behind with a firearm. Despite being taken to the hospital, McGee's refused to take the prescribed medication for his injuries, which ultimately led to his passing 24 days later, which is both stupid and sad. During his recovery, authorities attempted to speak with McGee about the incident, but he refused to cooperate. It became apparent that McGee intended to seek his own revenge against the opposing gang member involved in the incident as he planned to handle the matter himself rather than having the individual arrested. While the investigation into McGee's attack continued, Chandler, in a separate incident, pulled a weapon on someone else just a few streets away from where the initial incident took place. Fortunately, the victim survived, and Chandler was arrested and tossed in jail. Adding a disturbing twist to the case, Chandler made a rap video in which he not only made references to the attack on McGee, but also admitted to attacking him from behind. Chandler's skills were dumped by the police, who probably just aren't fans of rap, and the video showcased Chandler's reckless attitude and complete disregard for the consequences of his actions. Chandler's criminal history is extensive, having been arrested seven times for felonies and five times for misdemeanors since the age of 11. His past convictions include charges of fleeing to elude, grand theft of a motor vehicle, and vehicle burglary. At the time of the attack, Chandler was on juvenile probation. Law enforcement authorities are determined to bring Chandler to justice, with the Polk County Sheriff's Office actively seeking the gun used. Well, this guy obviously has more stuff to rap about in the future. Number two, the Festival Fugitive. Ryan McTee, or simply known as the Festival Fugitive, was captured after evading law enforcement for over a year. His escapade began after violating the terms of his parole, which led to a nationwide manhunt. McTee had been released on parole midway through a six-year sentence for robbery, a crime that tragically resulted in the passing of a shopkeeper, although he wasn't the one directly involved in the attack. During his time on the run, McTee brazenly flaunted his freedom by attending music festivals and posting pictures on social media. His participation in various music festivals like Ibiza, Carnival, and Creamfields became a taunt to the police who were actively seeking his apprehension. Despite his parole violations, McTee maintained his innocence in committing any additional crimes. He expressed frustration at being categorized alongside actual criminals, claiming he hadn't committed any new offenses. McTee's reign as the festival fugitive came to an abrupt end when armed police arrested him at gunpoint in Coventry. The arrest followed extensive surveillance and the authorities Authorities swiftly apprehended him at an address in Holbrooks. In addition to the parole violation, McTee was also detained on suspicion of cultivating some illicit plants, further complicating his legal situation. It's worth noting that McTee, although involved in the robbery, wasn't directly responsible for the attack that resulted in the shopkeeper's unfortunate passing. Nonetheless, he was held accountable for his role in the crime. With his capture, McTee now faced not only the consequences of his parole violations, but also the additional charges related to the suspected cultivation of the illegal plants. He also bragged about being called sweaty, which is a 
really weird thing to be proud of. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here for our past release on more dumb criminals. Number one, the bankers. Senna Mascar, a former bank manager, found herself leading a double life fueled by a 24,000 pound a month empire. Ascar abandoned her career in corporate banking with the Royal Bank of Scotland and NatWest at the age of 37 to run the Sniper dealer line alongside her husband, Rashid Hussein. Their illicit activities flooded the streets of Rockdale with party powder and even a harder contraband, enabling them to live a luxurious lifestyle. Ascar's previous job as a bank manager added an unexpected twist to her involvement. During a police raid on their 3.1 million pound apartment, the officers discovered incriminating evidence included digital scales, packaging materials, and debt lists. The couple had used the proceeds from the illegal empire to fund a designer lifestyle, purchasing expensive Rolex watches, designer clothes worth nearly 18,000 pounds, and even two pedigree cats for 3,000 pounds. They lived lavishly, spending their ill-gotten gains without restraint. Adding to their downfall was Hussein's online bragging about his income. Voice notes recovered by the police revealed him proudly boasting about his financial success. A video showed him showing off stacks of cash, claiming that the money had made him. Their social media presence, coupled with their extravagant spending, made it all too easy for law enforcement to connect their activities to their illicit profits. Even after being bailed out, Asgard continued to run the operation from her hometown of Bury. A second raid at her residence uncovered 15,000 pounds in cash, large quantities of illegal substances, and a kilogram of a controlled substance which was mixed with the other substances to increase volume. Accounting notes indicated substantial cash flow from their criminal activities. During questioning, Asgard claimed not to know how her husband obtained his money, suggesting that she had been misled, like anyone was going to fall for that. However, her attempts to distance herself from the illegal activities were in vain, as the evidence against her was overwhelming. The couple's lack of discretion and failure to launder their illicit funds through legitimate businesses was probably a big part of their downfall. Their online presence and extravagant lifestyle were direct indicators of their criminal activities, making it easy for authorities to connect the dots. In the end, Asgar pleaded guilty and got three years and four months in prison. You'd think a bank manager would know a little bit better how to hide all of their illegal finances, right? Stupid. Click to watch one of these next videos. Videos. Let us know in the comment section what you think is dumber, rapping about a crime in a song or trying to run from the police.